What's on your radar, Ryan? Over the last year, more than 100,000 people in the United States died of drug overdoses, many of them poisoned by fentanyl they didn't realize was part of whatever they were using. An entire generation is getting wiped out, and the death count is only growing. The risks of addiction are different with the advent of fentanyl, not just in a degree, but in kind. The media talks about deaths from fentanyl as overdoses, but in almost every case, the person wasn't trying to take fentanyl. So you can't say you took too much of something you weren't trying to take in the first place. If somebody put fentanyl in your vodka, you wouldn't say you overdosed. You'd say you were poisoned. And that's what's happening. Living as a person with a drug addiction today means that you're constantly at risk for that kind of poisoning, which is that much more of a reason to get off of it. Yet there's very little public effort being put into thinking creatively about how to turn this trend around. For years now, we've known that abstinence-only, big book, 12-step style drug treatment doesn't work for opioid addiction. There are certainly some people it has worked for, but the research is very clear that more is needed. Now, what's known as medication-assisted treatment, which involves the drug buprenorphine, has been proven to be highly effective, yet the federal government puts unique restrictions on prescribing it. We simply don't treat any other disease like we do addiction. There's a bipartisan bill in Congress called the MAT Act that needs to pass as quickly as possible so that doctors can start prescribing this medication for people ready for it. In 2015, I edited and helped report a story by investigative reporter Jason Cherkis that lays all of this out. And if you're interested, I'd suggest reading the whole thing, which we can include in the notes to this video. And if you know anybody who might benefit from it, please share it. But I also want to talk about another approach to treatment that gets almost no attention in the mainstream press. And that's the so-called entheogenic drugs like psilocybin, ayahuasca, or ibogaine. Ayahuasca and ibogaine in particular are already well in use by people seeking out help for addiction. And we're at a place in our opioid epidemic that we really can't afford not to take them seriously. Both ibogaine and ayahuasca are illegal in the United States, though ayahuasca is allowed for some religious purposes. They're both available in underground settings, but people have also been traveling overseas to clinics or retreats specifically designed around Ibogaine or ayahuasca treatments. Ibogaine originated, originated in Africa, whereas ayahuasca comes from the Amazon, but both are available in Mexico and in much of the rest of the Western Hemisphere that isn't the United States. Now, I've never taken Ibogaine, but I tried ayahuasca while I was writing my first book, This Is Your Country on Drugs. So in the 1990s and early 2000s, I was in my late teens and early 20s, and LSD and shrooms were making a major comeback amid a general nostalgia for the 60s. So heading into the ayahuasca journey, I figured my experience with those psychedelics would easily prepare me for it. I couldn't have been more wrong. They're nothing alike. On acid, for instance, a wall might look to you like it's melting or waving. The hallucination looks very real, but you know that it's just a hallucination. You still have one foot anchored on Earth. Ayahuasca takes you out of this plane of reality entirely and out of any sense of time itself. And most people experience what's known as a, quote, dark journey. And it is absolutely not even remotely fun at all. There's nothing recreational about it whatsoever. In the depths of an ayahuasca journey, you really don't know that you're hallucinating. You might be talking to your long dead ancestor or to Harry Reid or a fire breathing dragon, and it feels like you're actually with them. I've heard some people describe it as dreamlike, because when you're deep in a dream, you don't really know that you're dreaming. Nightmare might be a better term. Now, I wasn't taking it for addiction treatment, but having gone through it, it's easy to see its therapeutic potential, despite how horrifying it can be in the moment. Going into it, a friend had described it as six years of therapy packed into a single night, and I had no idea what he meant. But coming out of it, I knew precisely what he meant. Ibogaine, as I understand it, is similar, though it's said to be better, even better, at helping people detox and go through opioid or cocaine withdrawal. Now, the public is starting to see the potential. In 2019, Oakland moved to decriminalize entheogenic plants. In 2020, Santa Cruz, Ann Arbor, and Washington, D.C. did the same. In 2021, Seattle and Detroit moved in that direction. Scientific research has found clues to the potential mechanisms at work. One paper published in the International Journal of Drug Policy called Ayahuasca's Entwined Efficacy, an ethnographic study of ritual healing from addiction, summarized the research, writing, Published studies such as this one suggest that the brew increases neuroplasticity, facilitates adaptive neural architectural changes, and breaks down pathological associations, triggers, and cues associated with addiction. 
ayahuasca is thought to increase 5-HT levels, attenuating withdrawal symptoms associated with a cessation of cocaine or heroin use. DMT, one of the active components of ayahuasca, is also thought to exert uh, anxiolytic effects through 5-HT1A receptor agonism. The central nervous system effects of ayahuasca are thought to involve a reduction in the activity of the default mode network, which is also reduced in meditative states. So the problem for treatments like this is that they can't really be studied in the way we've set up clinical research requirements. A randomized trial requires half the people to get a treatment and the other half to get a placebo. And giving somebody a placebo of ayahuasca is basically impossible. You would know. The randomized trial model puts 100% of the obligation for the efficacy of the therapy directly on the medication. But these types of treatments also involve the experience of rituals and inter interaction with therapists or clinicians or shaman or whatever you want to call them. Neither the drug itself nor the ritual itself is sufficient alone, but it's when they work together that they become effective. The randomized trial model simply can't deal with that. Anyway, this is all way too much for one radar, but a few takeaways. We have an absolute crisis on our hands, and we need to think creatively for ways out of it. And if you or somebody you know is stuck in a substance abuse rut, there are options that aren't just scam 28-day inpatient treatments. And Congress needs to hurry up and pass the MAT Act. And while they're at it, take DMT off the controlled substance list, or at least make it available for treatment. I would like to present you with this honorary libertarian card. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank so, you. It was, it was beautiful. I'm tearing up. The Excellent. beautiful radar. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Voting libertarian from now on. Sweet. Um, yeah. Libertarian no. Party was got to be very happy about that Washington, D.C. Absolutely. Absolutely. A, re a reason for Robbie to go to the polls. <sighs> Absolutely. It's beautiful. Now it's uh, got to legalize those, those hallucinations. I mean, what, what do I have to say? Yeah, and I, obviously I don't encourage anybody to break any federal laws. Nope. If you, but if don't you're, do that. If you are currently addicted to, let's say, heroin or pills, you are breaking federal laws right now. So I'm actually encouraging people to stop breaking federal laws. The, the money that we are dumping into these scam 28-day rehabs is in the, in the multi-billion. That have recidivism, or not recidivism, it's not the right, right. word, relapsing, Re right? Yeah. Uh, relapse uh, is off the charts. Yeah, and, there, and I've, written in, I've written before about this that, so private equity is buying up all of these rehabs because they're so lucrative. There, there have been plenty of cases of people going out and paying people after they've left the 28-day thing. We'll give you $500 to relapse. And they give them drugs and $500 so that, that they come right back in. And then say, well, hey, relapse is part of recovery. Okay, yes, relapse is part of recovery. But this is a, this is yeah. a scam 28-day uh, facility that is just taking another 30000 Because it can be $30,000 that you get from, say, Medicaid or private insurance that is required to pay for this. And, and so they're, they're, they, they're not incentivized to help people. Whereas uh, with, a, with an ayahuasca journey, the, the money isn't in there for either private equity or for big pharma. And so as a result, there isn't much emphasis on it. And it can be expensive. It could be $5,000 to go to Mexico or to go to Panama or to go to Costa Rica for one of these retreats. But, uh, but $5,000, if your friends and family can get it together, uh, to change your life, uh, if, if you make a serious commitment to it, is, is more than worth it, not just for you, but for society. It shows that all drugs are not the same in our approach, the, the criminalized right. approach treat, that right. treats all, I think, I think of um, DARE, right? <laughs> Drug abuse, resistance, education, I don't know if you went through that as a kid. Oh, yes. That took this, this view that like, yeah, there's no difference. If you try marijuana for the first, you might as well be taking heroin. Right. You might as well be, you know, in, straight into your veins. Which right, is, <laughs> which is no one's experience with marijuana. <laughs> and also, I, I, I'd love anybody in the kind of DEA to go through an ayahuasca journey and then, and then pretend that that was recreational. <laughs> like, that was not fun. Like, you did that to search your soul. Like, you did that for reasons that go so far beyond just partying and having a good time. It, you're incapable of partying. You couldn't be at a club. You couldn't it, forget, like, would it be dangerous to operate a vehicle? You couldn't get behind the wheel. You're just, you're just laying there vomiting. Like, and I, it sounds horrible, and it kind of is. But you, but you come out of it feeling like, as my friend said, that you went through six years of therapy coming out clean on the other side. It's, it's, it's just a remarkable 
uh, and, and you can really feel the way that it, that it would have potential for people who are stuck in these uh, addictive ruts. All right, I'll clear my schedule. And do we have, do we have Kamala yet? Because no, nobody has described an ayahuasca journey better, it turns out, than our good vice president, Kamala Harris. Right, the significance of the passage of time. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay these wires, what we need to do to create these jobs. The significance of the passage of time. Passage of time. And, you're, you're, and you just feel like you're stuck in this loop, this time loop. She, now, she wasn't on ayahuasca because there's no way she could even be standing at the podium, but she is accurately describing the, the sense. A, uh, a, a master of words, our vice president. <laughs> she is. Anyway, we'll have more rising right after this.